Hi, everybody. Nice to be here and speak. So I'm going to talk about e-prescription at a distance. Where is my medicine? And as Pardonil mentioned, this is a project that we're running with Chalmers, uh, Rice, uh, EMC, and, and my spin-off company that's currently called Dragonship. Um, so what we have here is a s sort of unique opportunity. We have this area that's roughly the size of Belgium in northern Sweden. It's also very sparsely populated. And it's uh, eight health rooms and about seven of these um, healthcare centers, or what do we call them? Community rooms is what you should, you should say, yes. So, as Perdoni mentioned, there's a lot of uh, unnecessary traffic here. You have to drive with a car back and forth to deliver a small sample. So, Perdoni came up with this idea of can you do this with a drone? So if you look at uh, the market today, uh, there are basically two types of drones. Uh, one is called, uh, k k maybe this is in the way for this. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's the common drone, which is called the multi-rotor drone. It's sort of the drone equivalent of a helicopter. It can lift, uh, lift up and land vertically and it, uh, and it has a ca capability to hover in place, or so stay in a fixed place. But it cannot fly very far and it cannot go very fast. Uh, a fixed-wing drone is much more rare, and, and that, that's a drone that has wings and it can fly and cover long distances and has a long endurance. But it's sort of more difficult to use. You have to have a field where you can start it and, and land it in a horizontal way and it has no hover capability. So basically you need a sort of drone that can combine both of these, the best things about both these types of drones in order to perform the task and fly these long distances, such as Sture Mantus Lusfors. So, but before I get into this more, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got here. So I, I was here at the conference yesterday and I, I, it's, this is a new, new world for me, e-health or, or and, and, and this sector. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backstory. So, I started off just two years ago. I was working, uh, did my did my PhD, and I was working in, in the aerospace industry, developing parts for for turbines for motors. And uh, the aerospace industry has many similarities, I think, with this care industry that it, that it's uh, it's very conservative, takes a long time to change. So here's a picture of a, a jet plane in 1958, and one that's actually today. They did an old paint job on this because the KLM was celebrating their sort of 100th anniversary or something, but the plane is actually uh, top of the line plane. So you see in 60 years or so, not much has changed. So I started thinking a lot about how you can use simulation or 3D printing, uh, consumer drone technology to sort of accelerate the process of aerospace product development, really. How, do we, how, ca how can we build new planes faster? Because we need to. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, most related to env the environment, but, but we need to start moving a lot faster. And I, uh, and I found out uh, there was this uh, work that NASA had done on developing these types of, of, of aircraft, and they, they, they wrote this great book about it, and, and, and they showed that you could develop these high, high um, very advanced new radical concepts, such as this vertical takeoff and landing machine here, by, by doing small scale models that look very much like toys, but then you can, uh, then you can uh, do a design iteration circle very fast, and, and it doesn't cost much money, and you can learn, uh, your make mistakes early on where it's, where it's easy to fix. So they started by building something like this, uh, and then they moved on to build a, a different prototype which was similar, uh, and this was done. For, this is in a wind tunnel, and th they could do the te aerodynamic testing of it. And you can see that this is really being hold, held together by duct tape and stuff like that. So they they're moving very fast. And then they came up with the concept that looks something like this. Uh, and this is a carbon fiber frame, which is about three meters across, and uh, has a very high uh, lift capability. And uh, as you show here, it can transfer from hovering to cruise, and then it can cover large distances. So I thought this was very inspirational. Uh, and uh, 
this is s something on, on this order that we would need. So I started, before I even met Pardonial, I started building my own models, uh, more, more as a sort of a hobby, as a night and weekend thing, while I was doing my, my regular job. And this was the first model that I designed. This is in the summer of 2017. And this is a uh, uh, tandem tilt wing design. It's the first time I took it up flying. And this is the uh, first time doing the transition into to, to, to cruise flight, to vertical flight. And this was a very nice plane, and I was very happy that it worked right away. The uh, problem was that it didn't you couldn't really steer it when you were going forward, so you can just go <laughs> straight ahead, and you had to shoot up again. So it's because you didn't have any control surfaces on the wings. Uh, then I could take it back to Chalmers. So this is in September of, of, of uh, last year. I start testing it in the wind tunnel to really understand the aerodynamics of this thing. And I learned that I really didn't know that much <laughs> about aerodynamics. And I could come up with a new design very fast that was a lot better. And like the, the fascinating thing about the me is that before working in aerospace, or, or uh, not the fascinating thing about me, the fascinating thing about this, in my opinion, is that before working uh, in aerospace, I was working in, in space. Uh, and and what's striking about these drones is not that they you know, have the best design or, or shape, it's that you can actually do very advanced aerospace projects with almost no money. The, the, the sort of uh, sensors, the computers that are on this, are on the order of like a million times more powerful what, than what landed the Apollo uh, moon lander on the moon. And you can start doing this yourself with a 3D printer. So this is like very exciting. Uh, by, by the time I started doing this, I started being able to secure some funding for this. So first I got some money from the Chalmers Innovation Office and we can design a larger drone that actually had, had these control surfaces. And these are some, some videos from the, uh, that wind tunnel testing. So wh what you do is you have a lot of measuring equipment here and you can understand how it's performing. This is also doing some Harvard tests with the new a new design. And the good thing about this tan tandem tilt wing uh, design is that it's aerodynamically efficient in cruise, so we can f cover large distances. It's also very efficient when it's hovering because it has a large rotor disc area. Uh, it has large payload capacity, which means you can carry a lot of things, and it has a long range and a high top speed. So by the time I designed this, uh, I'd come in contact with Perdoniel and we um, we made this application to Vinova, saying that this is how the drones of the future uh, should look like. And, um, and I think Vinova was very impressed, I think mostly because we have a very good case here. We, have, we can actually do something useful. And um, so the first thing I would have was to reinvent the, the production principle because I've been 3D printing these drones and they become excessively heavy and brittle. So instead I used this technique where you have a hot wire and you can cut an, a wing out in in like 15 seconds or so and this is this is very important because you need to have the speed of the design iteration process so that you can create uh, prototypes discard bad ideas keep the good ideas and move uh, quickly this is how how you cut the the core it's made out of a material called xps foam which is actually uh the same thing you use in floor insulation so you can actually buy this very cheap and this is th this drone and this is uh, when it was finished, is before we did some flight testing, and now it's a little bit more duct taped. Uh, we also made a little bit of innovation where we put the nose cone of this uh, actually is swappable, and we thought that if we, if we might as well be flying me medicine, we might as well use this sort of extra real estate we have there to do different uh, missions. So we could either use put like a camera on this, used for power line inspection. You see there's a camera on this right now. You could. Imagine putting a, some sort of scientific experiment on this uh, uh, or, or use it with forestry with a heat camera to, to track um, yeah, uh, wildfires, for instance, or wildlife uh, tracking and stuff like that, and other test bed activities. So, so basically, if you have uh, one, one mission would be to fly something from one place to another, but when you also already have this infrastructure, maybe you can find different uh, uses, something to piggyback on there. 
So I've been talking a lot about aircraft, but if there's one thing I learned in the past year is that the aircraft is really only one piece of the puzzle. A and it's more important, I think, instead of asking, like, how do, we, how do I build a great aircraft for, for this mission? It's like, how do we create a useful, uh, reliable service? Because, uh, as I said, the aircraft is only one small piece, and uh, there's much more that's regarding to legislation, to reliability, uh, building base stations, in in ensuring connectivity. So, uh, and ultimately, it's the service that we provide to, uh, to, to the people in the health room that matters. Uh, and, and so I've switched my mindset a lot from focusing on on being in the shop building this aircraft to traveling around, talking to people uh, that are expert in different fields and coming up with this together. And, and my opinion so far is that uh, this is a unique opportunity. I think this is uh, uh, there's not many projects like this in the world. And we have, we have the, the uh, opportunity here to actually really show the world something that, that uh, can set, up, uh, set a precedent for, for the rest of the world to follow. So, what's next? Uh, in Vestavik Airport on May 3rd, 2019, we're going to do the demo flight of the final carbon fiber version of, th of this plane, and it's actually going to look very, very different from this. Uh, I can't say more about that right now, but it's going to be very exciting. Uh, and uh, in the summer of, of, of uh, 2019, we want to get the permits with Transportstyrelsen to do some demo flights, to fly beyond visual line of sight, uh, to to uh, So, with that, I thank you for listening. And if do we have any time for questions or? <laughs> <coughs> thank you. I must thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a real fun part of uh, my work. <coughs> um, and because Dean didn't show up, we can have time for some questions. Uh, Kurt, uh, please wait for the mic. <coughs> Very nice uh, idea. And um, wha what is the lifting capacity and, and, and the speed? What, how long does it, does it take from uh, Sturium to Slussfors? So uh, it, it, it's sort of really uh, what, what, you, what, you, what, what you do is there's so in this NASA report, or, or there's this method where you how, how big you scale it really uh, uh, affects how, how the speed of it. So I think this one has a capabi cap lift capability of about one kilogram, and it will fly about one, uh, 135 kilometers per hour. Uh, because uh, uh, I was um, on a thesis in, in, in Stockholm and Karolinska, and yeah. there was uh, uh, some experiments on lifting uh, cardioverter defibrillators for, yeah. the for, for the cardiac arrest. And then they show up that uh, they could be very more rapid on the place where the accident had happened. So uh, it's very exciting uh, w what it can be done. Uh, what so to think yes, about uh, that? It's, it's, it's so uh, good that you bring this up. Uh, or with Karolinska, we've actually started collaborating with them on this very project. They've done some excellent work on this. Uh, they've um, they've showed that they you can arrive with a heart starter 16 minutes before the 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 ambulance arrives <coughs> on it on tests, actual tests that they did in in Otelia. Uh, uh, and and it's 10,000 people in Sweden every year that suffer out of hospital cardiac arrest, and only 10 percent survive. And you can compare that to say the 250 that die in traffic. I mean, this is a much, much bigger problem. And uh, and drones can really play a big role. And so I've been for the past weeks. I've been working with Karolinska. We applied for some co-funding. Co I think th the day before yesterday. So. Uh, we think this technology can be very much involved in it. And actually, th there you get, you really need the speed as well, because it's not really about range, it's about how fast you can get there. So you want to be there in three mini minutes or less. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have two uh, questions. There is um, another experiment going on in Rwanda yeah. with the blood transportions for uh, uh, women which are 
have delivered a baby or are in delivery. No. Could you say something about the differences between your your experiment and the Rwanda? Yeah, let me see. There, I can sh I can put this up here actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the other question is, um, or the remark is that you are developing this for rural areas, but as I mentioned for you yesterday, yeah. I think it is also very interesting for um, very uh, for countries which have a hi very high population density yeah. because they have no large distances but they have the problems of queues so it's <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It's, uh, very interesting for them as well D yeah so i can mention so there's is the interesting thing about this to to, to, to learn is that um, drones maybe started somewhere in the early 2010s or something like that or maybe really got their big breaks and there's hundreds of, 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 or if not thousands, of different drone companies, different projects in the world, and most, are f most of them are focused on technology. But, but there's only like two, in the entire world, there's only two projects that are actually running and doing something useful as of today. And one of them is Zipline in Rwanda, and the other one is Maternet in Switzerland. And, and so Zipline has this uh, fixed-wing drone that's launched from a catapult, and it delivers blood. Uh, f for instance, uh, uh, t t to help in delivering, uh, what do you say, in, in um, uh, the birth, what do you say, delivering babies, or, yes. yeah. The drones are not delivering the babies, obviously. <laughs> um, this is not how it works. No, they, <laughs> uh, they arrive by the, the stork uh, in Sweden. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can have a lot of bloodlust in that, and so so they deliver. And, and it's um, yeah, it's just a nice concept. They shoot it with a catapult. They have to go all the way around and back. So even if it's an efficient craft, they have to go all the way around and back. And and uh, I think they've the it's g good for them that they've done this in, in Rwanda. They have a very good collaboration with the Rwandan government, and that's one of the reasons why an American company would start there. Uh, and uh, and so so the legislation is just catching up for this, and and most analysts agree that that this uh, development towards drones will will take place in Europe and Asia, uh, maybe in Africa before it happens in the United States. So so we have a really like I would describe it as an unfair advantage here in Sweden. We have we have this great system where we could do research projects. Uh, collaborate with industry, have, have tight relations with legislative bodies, with, with uh, cross-disciplinary uh, uh, sort of collaborations with, with the health industry and stuff like that, and we can really be, be pushing this technology forward. So I sort of imagine this a little bit also like uh, what they have in Arvitsiaur and when they, when they have the testing for, for cars, that we, can, we could start building a drone testing area here in, in, in northern Sweden where we could uh, you know, really develop this technology. And I think that's a good point that, 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 um, that you could use this in highly urbanized areas as well. But I think we should start here because the chances of, that there might be a moment, if, if one of these things falls down and hits somebody, it's better to do it, uh, you know, in the forest. Or, I mean, if it falls down, it's better that it, it, something happens <laughs> here than it happens in Amsterdam or something like that. So people that are talking about delivering pizzas in in, uh, in um, New York, New York, I don't think it's it's, it's re really reasonable, and we're not there yet. We need to have a extreme reliability on these systems in order to get it to work. Okay, one one final question before we go into the the panel discussion. Um, I, just let me just tell you that actually I was afraid that we would not get funded when I saw the zipline concept because I thought Vinova will say that this is already going around, but uh, actually they had another opinion and we were very happy. Jari, please. Yes. Hello. Hey. Uh, I was an old pilot, so I must ask you talk about transport steers and yeah. do you need a flight plan for every flight and what? altitude can you use for this fl those flights so yeah so this is a there, there's a lot of different methods here uh, but basically you fly under 150 meters uh, and then you you uh, so there's basically two concepts one is to integrate this from with airspace integration which is that this flies in the same sort of uh, method way as, as helicopters and airplanes fly, and the other one is separation 
And that's the easy, easier thing to do, which is to create like a air corridor between Slussfosch and here, where you inform all the uh, helicopter pilots uh, that we're, we're going to be flying here, so you, you should watch out, basically. Um, and then, you, so, so you don't have to build a system for, for object avoidance or anything in that drone. And that's the easy way forward. And you apply for a permit, and that's like a two-week processing uh, for transport citizens to process that, and you can get the permit for like a week, a month, and up to a year. And then eventually you could do what like nuclear power plants and stuff like that ha have where, th where they actually have a no-fly zone over that area. So I could imagine that we yes. could secure like a no-fly zone indefinitely in like a 200-meter path between Slussfors and, and uh, that goes up 150 yes. meters between Slussfors and Sturmer. Okay.